All right, everyone, welcome. Today is the 22nd of February, 2015. Hey, we're about uh, maybe halfway to summertime here in the city, city of Chicago here. Uh, this is the Shadow Fire Promotions podcast. I want to thank everyone who is downloading this, streaming it, passing along the word about it, listening to it. Uh, whatever you may be doing, as long as you're doing it with our podcast, hey, it's all good. Uh, again, we have no advertising budget. We don't have any advertising. We can't have an advertising budget if we don't have any advertising, right? But uh, if anyone wants to throw money at us, hey, give me a holler. Let me know. Our email address, if you have any suggestions for future podcasts, if you have any suggestions for anything at all, if you have any comments about any of the topics that we cover on this podcast, our email address is podcast at sfpincchicago.com. That's SFP, like Shadowfire Promotions, INC, like Incorporated, like Shadowfire Promotions Incorporated, Chicago. That is two C's, SFP, INC, Chicago, because I'm anal retentive like that. In any case, let's continue onwards. There is a lot of stuff to discuss. We are uh, probably, uh, by this point, we are already involved in WWE Fast Lane the February pay-per-view that leads up to WrestleMania. So why don't we start with WWE? <laughs> First and foremost, WWE has just recently rebranded the Elimination Chamber as Fastlane. Okay, so a couple of thoughts on that. First and foremost... It's about time they got away from the concept of every pay-per-view has to fit into a certain theme, and every theme has to be the recurring theme between it, because, you know, it's getting as bad as uh, uh, what's TNA's pay-per-view uh, lockdown, where every single match takes place in a steel cage. You know, next thing we're going to have the Royal Rumble. Every single match on Royal Rumble be a battle royal. How cool would that be? We are going to make sure that for Royal Rumble, for three hours, WWE is going to entertain you by having three hours worth of battle royals. Way to go. We are going to burn out that gimmick so you'll be so tired of that gimmick, you'll never want to see another battle royal ever again. Uh, in all seriousness, this is kind of what WWE is doing. They are trying desperately to burn out every single gimmick match they have ever had. You know, they, they took Survivor Series and they made it into a regular pay-per-view because they decided they couldn't sell the five-on-five -five style of match. So instead, they went to just making it a regular pay-per-view, which is probably a good thing because they managed to not destroy the concept of Survivor Series. That said, though, WWE has been guilty in the past and in the not-too-far-distant uh, past of making sure that every single paper they had uh, fit into a certain gimmick. So, you know, you had the Elimination Chamber you had uh, all these other uh, pay-per-views. You know, all of them had to fit into a certain theme. Uh, and, and that's been more of a bad habit of theirs over the last, I want to say, three or four years or so. But they've been real bad, you know, tables, ladders, and chairs, or Night of Champions, where every single match is a title match. Uh, we're going to have tables, ladders, and chairs, where every match is a tables, ladders, and chairs style match. Uh, you know, the Hell in a Cell, every single match has got to be a cage match to match the Hell in a Cell gimmick. Uh, WWE is really, uh, really trying to burn out every single gimmick match they have with this style. Uh, they tried bragging rights for a year, 
And then they realized rapidly that no one gave a shit about Raw and SmackDown as individual brands. That First off, WWE never really encouraged a brand split. They were of the sense of mind that said, we don't care as long as we're watching both brands. We don't particularly care. And there was no reason for WWE to say, build loyalty in this brand or that brand. You know, watch Raw but not SmackDown. Watch SmackDown but not Raw. There was no reason for them to do such. So, so bragging rights as a concept failed miserably. Uh, you know, extreme rules where every single match is going to be the extreme rules, the ECW style match. It's a quick way to kill a gimmick. And WWE has no one but themselves to blame for it. And uh, to talk about the WWE Network, the whole reason why WWE is seeking new ways of distributing our product, don't let anyone bullshit you into thinking that it has to do with more people are streaming or anything like that. The UFC does just fine without a streaming presence every single pay-per-view. They do very good on pay-per-view. I don't know their numbers. I don't care about the numbers. But I'm thinking they do pretty damn good. Why? Because they successfully build up their pay-per-views. They build up their fights. And they try to avoid uh, uh, overkill at their fight. No one wants to see the same people that are going to fight on Sunday or Saturday fight three days earlier because it's just going to kill the match. And WWE's got a really bad habit of saying, well, here, we're going to build interest. We're going to have the same exact match for the whole year as the main event. Okay, so we know that John Cena is our champion. John Cena is the chosen one. So for the next 12 months, every single pay per guarantee John Cena is going to be in the main event because we know you want to see him there, WWE Universe. What's that? You don't want to see him? Well, fuck you. We're going to do it anyway. It doesn't matter. And just to make sure we piss you off all the more, we're going to make sure that we break up that year into three chunks. So like four matches out of that year is going to be John Cena versus one guy. Second half of the year for four pay-per-views. We're going to have John Cena versus a second dude. And then we're going to go you know, finish up the year with John Cena versus the third guy to make sure that every pay-per-view repeats its main event at least three or four times throughout the year. And while I'm being sarcastic, the bottom line is that WWE has done that in the past. They've done that in the not-too-distant uh, past, and it's the reason why their pay-per-views are not doing well because they keep repeating their main events, they keep going and giving away their main events, they keep trying to fit every pay-per-view into a theme, you know, and and it's killing it. Uh, As an example, a very, very, uh, uh, by way of an example, not necessarily a real-world example, not anything that happens, you have Wrestler A, and Wrestler A debuts in WWE, and all of a sudden, he said, you know what, Wrestler B, I know I just got here a week ago and I just met you Monday Night in Raw, and I'm going to meet you for the second time on SmackDown, but come Sunday, I'm going to be feuding with you in a steel cage because, damn it, it is hell in a cell, and I've got to figure out a way to get you in a cage somehow so it doesn't matter that I didn't have a feud with you before. I'm going to have a feud with you now. And that's, you know, it's, it's an extreme example, but it's very, very true about what WWE does. And the overall idea that I'm trying to get across is that it doesn't matter what WWE names their pay-per-views. It has absolutely no bearing on anything whatsoever. And WWE could name their pay-per-view the WWE Pay-Per-View. And the people that are going to buy it are still going to buy it. And the people that are not going to buy it are not going to buy it. Pay-per-view still does well as a concept. 
UFC seems to be doing pretty good. You haven't heard them call out the UFC network. So clearly there is a value in pay-per-view. WWE does not see it because WWE is so short-sighted and goes from one month to the next and just doesn't care about their viewership that so many people have been turned off by it that they can't make money on pay-per-view. Now, I've heard that they put out uh, surveys to the WWE Universe every so often saying, what do you want to see? But there's two things at play with that. First off, the people you're reaching are the people that are still watching your product, which isn't necessarily indicative of the people that have uh, what they call the lapsed fan, uh, which is just a fancy word for saying the guy that says, you know what, I'm done. I'm tired of this. I don't want to watch it no more. Uh, and, and two, we're also going into a very, I don't want to say a slippery slope per se, but if you're not going for the people that still care, um, you know, you're only going to get a handful of people that are going to fill out those things as it exists. So WWE needs to learn they could call their pay-per-view whatever the hell they want. Changing the name from Elimination Chamber to Fast Lane does nothing for them. They're not going to get any extra buys. They're not going to get any network support. Oh my gosh, we've just topped 10 billion buys on the WWE Network because we renamed our pay-per-view. I hope that's not what the internal logic is thinking in WWE where they say, oh, we are guaranteed to get so many more subscribers because we changed the name. WWE needs to learn. The name of their pay-per-view doesn't matter. It doesn't matter a lick. No one cares. People are going to buy the pay-per-view based on what the card is. And that goes to another rant about WWE, which is they really need to announce what their card is sometime in advance of the show to give people an opportunity to decide if they want to buy it early on or not. Um, so moving on from there, let's talk a little more about... Uh, the WWE Network. So, it has just recently come to light via a press release that the WWE Network, having expanded into Great Britain, the UK, uh, and probably a couple of places, recently topped 1 million subscribers. Congratulations, WWE. It's a nice little bragging point that they can talk about and say, Yes, we've topped 1 million subscribers. Congratulations to us. We're the best. We know it. Except for two little problems. One, they were hoping for a million subscribers a year ago. They were hoping for a million subscribers just in the U.S. long before they got into expanding overseas. And two, anyone with half a brain needs should be able to figure out that it's not how many subscribers are currently on the network. That's the most irrelevant uh, statistic that WB can offer. It looks great for their shareholders to say, yes, well, we have a million subscribers right now that have just subscribed. It looks really good. It's a great bullet point for their investors who probably don't know any better. Uh, that's a whole other topic altogether. I'll get to that in just a second, actually. Uh, but it's not how many subscribers they have. It's how many subscribers they retain from month to month. They need to be able to put out content that, from month to month, uh, entertains, enlightens, interests, whatever uh, choice of uh, verb or adjective that you uh, elect to put in there. That's what counts. 
I know on the podcast with Triple H, he's bragging, oh, you get February free. You know, this podcast is already worth the price of admission. NXT is worth the price of admission. It's not a matter, and, and I don't know if Triple H realizes this. I hope he does. I sincerely hope he does. I sincerely hope Vince McMahon realizes this. It's not how many people show up. It's how many people stay. Giving people free February, no credit card, no commitment, that's terrific. Give people a taste of what you got. But it better be putting your best foot forward because, again, it's not a matter of how many people are subscribing. It's how many people are staying there. Uh, continuing on with the WWE Network, former member of the Fantastics, Bobby Fulton, uh, Bobby Fulton, Tommy Rogers, the Fantastics, great tag team, wrestle all around the world. Um, one of the many uh, good-looking pretty boy type tag teams. They were probably one of, they were uh, in the NWA most famously, they were uh, a, a terrific team, just a great team. That you know, like a lot of other tag teams of that era, the Midnight Express, the Rock and Roll Express, just fluid, just just really poetry in motion. If you have a chance to find something with the Fantastics, they're a really great team to watch. Um, don't know of anything off the top of my head in my inventory that has them, uh, but if I come across something, I'll make sure to go and plug it in a future podcast. Anyway, so Bobby, Bobby Fulton has been pushing on his personal Facebook profile. He's been circulating something that has said that if you have appeared on content that is appearing on the WWE Network to contact him. Why? Because these wrestlers are not being paid royalties. And Bobby feels that if you are appearing on footage owned by Vince, owned by WWE, you should be paid royalties. It's really hard to disagree with Bobby's uh, point of view. If there's a TV series, doesn't matter, name a television series, name a television series from the past, it doesn't matter whether you changed networks, changed owners, doesn't matter. The talent involved from the actors to the camera people, every single person involved with the television show is always still paid their royalties no matter how many hands that show has gone through, and it doesn't matter how old that show is. People that talk about their favorite TV show not appearing on DVD probably has a lot to do with the issue of royalties towards the talent, whether it be the on-camera talent or the off-camera talent. So this was made mention recently on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash SFPINC Chicago. Catch in a pattern, you know, our, our email podcast at SFPINCChicago.com. Our Facebook, facebook.com slash SFPINC Chicago. While I'm sitting there talking about things, let's talk about our website, sfpincchicago.com. It's not fully set up yet, but I know that our web development team is hard at work following our instructions to get the site done. We're hoping for launch in either late 2015 or early 2016. In either way, we should have the site up then. It's going to be very, very cool. There's going to be a lot of great vintage stuff out there. VHS, DVD, 
all sorts of great stuff, stuff you probably didn't even know existed. And while I'm at it, let me just make a, a little personal note. If you're one of those people that says, I don't need a VCR, every single thing I've ever wanted to own is on DVD, you're wrong. Okay, let me just state that, put that out in the open right now, you're wrong. There is tons, tons of great stuff, whether it be stuff from the old territories, uh, whether it be old WWS stuff, whether it be old WCW stuff. There is gobs and gobs of great stuff that does not exist on DVD. If you need a VCR, hey, find your local secondhand store. Find your local Salvation Army, your local Goodwill. Any of those places can probably get you a VCR at a very reasonable price. You can probably even get a combination player for under $10 at most of these places. But I would, on a personal note, highly encourage you to get yourself a VCR. There's plenty of great stuff that you're going to see that isn't on the WWE Network, isn't on DVD, isn't streaming. I know the big thing is everyone to go on YouTube and you know you can pretty much find anything you want. If you're only into WWF, WWE, then you know what? You're right. You don't need a VCR. If your world is limited to WWE, then you know what? You're absolutely right. You don't need anything. Stay where you're at. Stay the course. Uh, because you don't need it. However, if you believe there is life beyond WWE, if you're looking for great stuff from Memphis, if you're looking for some great independent wrestling, if you're into great mixed martial arts, there's all sorts of things, including pride fighting, including strike force, including King of the Cage, just plenty of things that have never, ever made it to DVD. So, again... I would highly, highly encourage you to go and get a VCR. Again, you can probably find one for under 10 bucks at your local Salvation Army, your local Goodwill, any of those places is likely going to find you a VCR. There's a lot of wrestling out there, and I know that most people think that the only wrestling that's ever existed is WWE. WWE started at the turn of the century. You know, I know Frank Gotch was signed to WWE. I know that Gord Hackensmith was signed to WWE. They were the very first WWE employees. But despite that, there's a lot of great wrestling that didn't make it to DVD and probably won't. There's great NWA WCW stuff that has never made it to DVD. I know WWE is fond of putting out these little DVD box sets, but that just doesn't include everything. It doesn't include the entire history of a lot of these companies. The AWA, the NWA, WCW... There's plenty of stuff that just has never made it to DVD. It would behoove you to get yourself a VCR. Now, moving onwards from there, we've still got plenty of stuff with the WWE to talk about, along with plenty of other mixed martial arts and professional wrestling. Um, so, on the recent Steve Austin podcast, we're going to talk about two different Steve Austin podcasts here. The first thing 
we're going to talk about is the biggest live Steve Austin podcast with the WWE boss, Vince McMahon. Uh, I'm not going to review it. It's out there. It's available. You can find it on Steve Austin's podcast. Um, there's probably a video of it somewhere. I'm not going to say talk or, or I'm not going to say review it, but I would like to suggest is the reason the Macho Man Randy Savage going into the WWE Hall of Fame is the reason he's there now this year going in before WrestleMania. Is it because Vince was put on the spot by Steve Austin? It was a live podcast. Vince had no way of backing out. He had no way of glossing over it. Steve Austin straight up asked him, why is Randy not in the Hall of Fame? Is, Rand, is the only reason Randy going into the Hall of Fame is because Vince felt he was put on a spot and he couldn't refuse because he was asked point blank? I want to hear your answers. So... Email me at podcast at sfpincchicago.com. Is the only reason Randy Savage in a Hall of Fame this year because the boss, Vince McMahon, was put on the spot on the Steve Austin Show podcast, the Steve Austin Show. Now, we're going to move to uh, a slightly different different tack, and then we're going to return to the podcast world. Um, there's been accusation, uh, certainly on the uh, very same Steve Austin show that Steve interviewed Vince McMahon, there's been accusations of McMahon being out of touch. Vince McMahon, uh, without, without actually looking up his age, although I'm going to do it right now just because, um, Vince is late 60s, I believe. So let me look this up real quick because it's only going to take a second. Let's find out. So Vince McMahon is 69 years old. So people are talking about Vince being out of touch. Vince is out of touch with the modern product. He's out of touch with what his fans want. He's out of touch with the WWE universe. Is Vince McMahon out of touch? Uh, I think Vince is. Vince truly is out of touch. You know, Vince says, Vince said in the uh, Steve Austin show how important it was to listen to the fans. But he didn't when it came to Daniel Bryan and the Royal Rumble uh, just a few months ago because, you know what, the fans are wrong. And Triple H pretty much alluded to that. He kind of threw Vince under the bus at the same time. But he said, no, the beauty of this is there's one guy, one vision, one voice, and it's Vince McMahon. So you have a 69-year-old man telling basically 20 and maybe younger, especially in this uh, particular era, younger, uh, sitting there and saying, this is what you want. And if it isn't what you want, I'm not wrong, you're wrong. So I know there's a lot of hate for Roman Reigns out there. My opinion on Roman Reigns is the same as John Cena. I don't really give a crap one way or the other. I don't have a, a particular eye internet fire. But I know that Roman Reigns appeals to Vince McMahon for the same reason that John Cena does. Uh, Roman more so because he's very big, he's tall, he's muscular. He's everything that Vince kind of salivates over, that, that bodybuilding type. Uh, you know, and Daniel Bryan, he just doesn't get Daniel Bryan. Daniel's a, the indie wrestler, the, the guy who made it from the indies. He, he's vegan. He's, he's a goat face. You don't want him as your champion. And No, I'm not wrong. You're wrong. Because I listen to the fans, says Vince McMahon. I don't think he does. 
I know that Vince likes to portray that. He likes to go and say, we listen to the fans here at WWE. It sounds great. It's a hell of a soundbite. It's also complete crap. Um, I know that uh, Steve Austin, when he interviewed Triple H on the Steve Austin show, though it's also the same thing. Hey, if things aren't going a certain way, you adjust on the fly. But, um, you know, I don't believe that the fans have more power than they did or that are more, I mean, they're more knowledgeable. I'll give you they're more knowledgeable. But other than being more knowledgeable, I don't think there's that much of a difference. They may be more knowledgeable, more sophisticated, but in regard to, we listen to the fans. First off, no they don't. You, the, the Vince likes to think so, but he sets himself up for failure. And this has been said by, by way more people than, than myself. Vince saying, the fans are in charge. The fans tell us what they want. The fans dictate the direction of the storyline. Um, first off, it's bullshit, because they don't. You know, he does, Vince McMahon does in the end. But second off, it's a very slippery slope to say, well, the fans dictate the storylines because all of a sudden, the fans are empowered. They're empowered to boo the everything crap out of it, turn their back on any storyline that's presented, and then Vince is left scrambling, saying, well, the fans are in charge. But they're not. He's in charge, and he may not say that publicly, but he's in charge. He's in charge, and what he says goes. Whether he's out of touch or not is really irrelevant, but the bottom line is it's not all the fans tell us what to us, all about the fans. No, it just makes a terrific sound bite, but there's absolutely no basis in reality with that. Uh, so so that that kind of talks about both the podcast with Hunter and the podcast with McMahon. Although there was there was some occasions when Hunter kind of threw uh, you know Papa Vince under the bus a little bit, but but that's neither here nor there right now because I'm not going to get into that. That's a very minor thing overall. Uh, there was a lot of insight into the workings of WWE and what WWE does and what they want and their ultimate goal with both McMahon and Triple H. And Triple H's vision, if NXT is truly Triple H's vision, there may be hope for the company if Vince ever dies and, and leaves Triple H in charge. Um, but they have to get away with this fetish for, oh, it's real easy to be a WWF superstar because... One thing that, that stood out to me in Triple H's podcast with, or Triple H being a guest on the Steve Austin Show podcast, is he talked about how uh, when, when Steve Austin asked the difference between a pro wrestler and a sports entertainer and a WWE superstar, he said, well, you know, anyone can be a pro wrestler. You know, some indie guy making 50 bucks a night can be a pro wrestler. But to be a WWE superstar is is the tip top. But there seems to be a contradiction there because at the same time, they're saying anyone can be a pro wrestler. Come to WWE University, i.e. the Performance Center. Come to WWEU and we will train. It doesn't matter who you are. That homeless guy off the street, give us time. He will be a he will be a WWE superstar. We can make anyone. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter your interest in pro wrestling. We can make you a WWE superstar. So it seems very contradictory to say, oh, being a WWE superstar is the top, and being a pro wrestler is, is kind of the bottom. Anyone can be that. 
because at the same time, they're cranking out people in the uh, performance center, and Triple H is kind of shitting on guys who are indie guys and saying, oh, you know, they they got all these bad habits to get over, and 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 it's terrible, you know, we want a guy we can create from scratch with no bad habits. But wait, I thought it was hard to be a WWE superstar. Now you're saying anyone can be a WWE superstar as long as they go through your performance center. So you got to make up your mind. You know, which is it? Um, anyway, so um, something else that was covered in the Steve Austin show with Triple H was China in the WDB Hall of Fame. Whether you believe China should be there or not is kind of irrelevant to what I'm going to be saying about it. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. If you have a thought about China being in the Hall of Fame, you can always email us a podcast at sfpincchicago.com, sfpincchicago.com podcast, sfpinkchicago.com, that is. Put China in the subject line. Tell me, what do you think? Does China belong in the Hall of Fame or not? She's, um, I'm not going to influence anyone's decision about that one way or the other. I've got my own thoughts about China. Uh, although Hunter really, really threw her into the bus. You know, saying, oh, what if someone Googled China and 20 years ago and, and, and her you know, Google's China and sees what China's done. How could we put someone like that in the Hall of Fame? And what he's alluding to is is China's career in porn, porn films. But he kind of neglects to mention, yes, it's completely and totally understandable that WWE doesn't want a porn star in the Hall of Fame because that would interfere with them having a convicted rapist in their Hall of Fame. And trust me, when it comes to levels of things you don't want to be associated with, being a porn star is absolutely much worse than being a convicted rapist. I mean, if I were to build a Hall of Fame, I would load up that Hall of Fame with convicted rapists. But I would never put a porn star in there. I would love to have a Hall of Fame full of convicted rapists. Because that's what Mike Tyson is. Mike Tyson is a convicted rapist. Think about that for a second. We can't allow China in there because China did porn. But Mike Tyson, a convicted rapist, is perfectly acceptable for this publicly traded PG company that is so squeaky clean and has never had a scandal in their life. We cannot allow porn stars in our company Hall of Fame because, damn it, it would clash with our ideals of having convicted rapists in our Hall of Fame. And if you're talking about people with bad decisions, well, Scott Hall and Jake Roberts have had one hell of a story, one hell of a journey to get them to the WB Hall of Fame. But if you want to look at the thing analytically and not look at the entire story, both of those fine gentlemen have had uh, some serious uh, problems relating to some poor choices they've made in their life. So are we saying that a career in porn or um, any suspected drug use that China may or may not have had is any better or worse than the stated drug abuse that both Scott Hall and Jake Roberts have admitted to? Is it any worse than being a convicted rapist? You know, WB is uh, very hypocritical at times when it comes to their Hall of Fame. And, and in regard to the Hall of Fame, I'm sure I said this in the last podcast. Um, if not, you know, I'll say it now, and if I did, I'll say it again. I understand what WB wants. Their Hall of Fame is a revenue-generating thing. 
This isn't a museum you can walk through and they can take tickets and make money that way. They make money based off the banquet and how many people will come and pay to see someone. So, as a result, their Hall of Fame is not going to be built on Tiger Mask and Dynamite Kid and spectacular workers who have really, you know, contributed to the business of professional wrestling. No, it's going to be filled with guys that think will sell tickets to a banquet. doesn't matter what you've done. They can make, you know, whatever false history they want to for a guy, because that's what WB, you know, can do. They can make up a history for you, but you need to be able to sell tickets. That's why Mike Tyson's in the Hall of Fame. That's why Scott Hall is there, Jake Roberts. Don't get me wrong. I've got a lot of respect for these guys. I think that what they've gone through is, is just incredible. But my question is, what have they done to rate? Have they had a Hall of Fame career? Has something about them really said, this guy should be, you know, he's one of the all-time greats. Because if I'm going to be honest, I'm going to say Jake may have a hell of a mind for the business. He may, he may cut a hell of a promo. I'm not sure if he's had a Hall of Fame career. And I've got to say the same for Scott Hall, and there's no disrespect to either man, because I don't know either one of them. But I'm just not going to sit there and say, at the end of the day, these guys have had a Hall of Fame career. I just don't think they have. You know, that's my opinion. In any case, let's move on. Um, I just recently made mention a, a minute or two ago about Vince McMahon being out of touch. And... There's been these calls recently uh, from investors saying, oh, Vince McMahon, you know, he's almost 70. He needs to step down as WWE CEO and all this nonsense. He should step down. We need a new CEO. He can, he can still be created. We need a new CEO. Um, WWE doesn't need a new CEO. I'm not a WWE apologist, but to be the head of World Wrestling Entertainment, you need someone who understands the wrestling business. I was explaining this to someone else not terribly long ago. You know, the people that are clamoring and saying, W needs a new CEO, those are people that are investing in the stock. And all they're looking at is that stock price. And they're saying, oh, the stock price is not doing good. WWE needs a new CEO because once they get a new CEO, then my stock portfolio will up again. WWE stock will be up. And you know what? I'll be happy because my stock portfolio will once again be where it belongs. So WWE just needs a new CEO. But the problem is the people that are clamoring for WWE to get a new CEO they're financial people. They understand the stock market. They understand investing. They understand finance. And that's terrific. But they don't understand professional wrestling. They don't understand what needs to be done to be a professional wrestling company. They're going to say, oh, you know what? We don't need this stuff. Uh, we don't need all these fireworks, this Monday Night Raw stuff. We don't need this. It costs too much money. And they're going to end up, let, let's just say this happens, your CEO, whoever that might be, will butt heads with McMahon regarding his creative vision and their financial vision because their goal is to make sure that WWE has a high stock value and nothing else. And they're going to say, look, running a wrestling company is the easiest thing in the world. You take two dudes in their underwear, you put them in a ring, and have them fake punch each other. I mean, seriously, this is super easy. Any idiot can do it. This is why we need a new CEO. 
And this is exactly the same reason why there's 10 billion indie federations that go absolutely fucking lutely nowhere. I hate to say it, I'm beginning to sound a little bit like Jim Cornette. I'm not sure if that's a bad thing or not. In any case, it's a stupid notion to sit there and say, oh, and they need a new CEO. Because, of course, it's so easy to run a wrestling company. Two dudes in underwear, fake punch. How, how hard can it be? Any CEO of any company understands his company. They understand the line of business their company is in. If you're the CEO of Coca-Cola, you understand the business of soda. You understand the business of soft drinks. You understand the purpose of marketing soft drinks as something that is cold, refreshing. If one wants it, they understand the purpose of getting those soft drinks to be the first thing that people look for when they want to drink. And getting it out to local restaurants, to McDonald's, to Burger you want everyone to have Coca-Cola out there. It's more than just a soft drink. It's a brand. It's a lifestyle. You need to be a cola drinker. But it's a lot easier to market Coca-Cola than it is to market WWE. And for all the financial wizards out there that say, WWE new to new CEO, I would like to humbly invite you to step up and see if you can run a major wrestling company. Like I say, I'm no WWE apologist, but you have to understand the business of professional wrestling to run a wrestling company. I know Vince doesn't run pro wrestling. Pro wrestling is what his father did. He was a sports entertainment company. Fine. Then they need a new CEO who understands a sports entertainment business. If you're one of those guys who's like under the age of 20 and says, well, there's no such thing as pro wrestling. Pro wrestling doesn't exist. It's sports entertainment. Okay, fine. Then you still need to have a CEO that understands sports entertainment for those who are under 20. I'm not sure if this podcast even goes out to those who are under 20. I think my audience tends to skew a little older. In any case, moving on. Let's see. What's the next thing we're going to talk about here? Stone Cold Steve Austin. Every so often, I encounter someone says, Steve Austin going to come back to the ring. Steve's coming back. He said so. I know the last time he said he was making a comeback was he was goofing about Gold's Gym with Rick Drayson, and everyone said, Steve's coming back to the ring. Steve's coming back. Steve will be back in the ring. Steve is not coming back to the ring. There is absolutely less than a cut hair's chance of Steve Austin coming back to the ring. Part-time, full-time, it doesn't matter. For a variety of reasons. First and foremost, Steve Austin's got a bad neck. He has no reason to come back and risk permanent paralysis permanent damage, worse than he already has, to come back to WWE. And I mean a return to the ring, not, you know, somebody comes out and cuts a promo and stuns someone. That doesn't hurt. That's not going to hurt his bad neck. I'm talking a real match where he might have to actually take a bump. And further to that, if he was going to be in a match... He needs to be in a match with someone that can move around a lot and take bumps for him and, 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 you know, move around a lot because he can't really take those bumps anymore. And if you subscribe to the Steve Austin show, he talked about something with Lita when Lita was on the show. And he said, you know, do you miss the business? Was it hard for you to get out of the business? And Steve had talked about how hard it was for him to get out of the business. And once my career has ended, it took a long time to accept that my career had ended. So I don't see Steve Austin coming back to the ring unless it's one hell of an opponent, 
but it has to be someone he trusts implicitly to take care of him, make sure he's not injured. I don't see it as being Sting. I definitely don't see it as being Hogan, who's older than Steve. Um, it'd be it'd be kind of neat if it was The Rock, but I think The Rock is so busy with movies, I I can't really see him uh, coming back at any point in time. Um, so yeah, not gonna happen. For those who are holding out, not gonna happen. He's not coming back. Um, not in any active wrestler sense, at least. A couple more things with WWE, then we'll move on. WWE, you know, they're the biggest thing, so they're and and it's been a while since my last podcast, so um, you know, a couple of things though. We just recently had a three-way match in WWE. We had Cena, Seth Rollins, and Brock. We look to be on the cusp of another three-way match at WrestleMania. There's the potential that we're going to have at WrestleMania Brock versus Daniel Bryan versus Roman Reigns. It's very much a possibility. Um, three-way matches suck for a variety of reasons. They're hard to market. They're even harder to work. I've seen three-way matches on every level there possibly could be, from the lowest indie to WWE. Three-way matches suck balls uh, because there's only so many ways to do a three-way match. And it always ends up being the one guy beats up the other dude, and the third guy's out of the ring. He's either hurt or thrown out or something, and then he comes back, and the focus shifts to him, and then the other guy interferes, and you're back to that. It's a difficult match, and I've heard wrestlers say that three-way matches are not only difficult to book, they're difficult to execute. Why WWE loves this whole, you know, three-way match? Well, the reason why is because they feel like they're appealing to everybody. They feel like, you know, by putting Cena in with Seth and Brock, then they'll at least, you know, appeal to Cena fans and Brock fans, and they might get Seth over too. And, hey, you know, if we put a WrestleMania Daniel Bryan in there, then we're going to appease Daniel Bryan fans as well as get over Roman Reigns and... Brock Lesnar, so I'll have a bunch of three-way matches. Um, three-way matches just don't work. They're they're difficult. They're hard. They're a hard sell too. Um, so they they really do suck on every level. You know, and then it's also a cop out. It's also a cop out because it's saying, "Hey, we can't figure out a good one-on-one matchup, so we're putting three guys in there. We're hoping that one guy there gets over." So, you know, it, it's 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 operate. No one gets a rub. No one gets any better out of it. It's just a way. It's a, a cheap and lazy cop out to say, "Hey." We couldn't figure out a good one-on-one main event, so we're going to try and get three guys in there. Um, speaking of getting guys in matches, the, the final thought I have on WWE is, hey, you know, you heard the old 60s song, My Boyfriend's Back. Well, hey, the authority is back. Hey, it was only two months. We sat through an incredibly, incredibly long uh, two months, two full months, almost 60 full days before WWE said, you know what, booking without the authority is difficult, so let's bring the authority back because then it's real easy to write shit. It's real easy because then we can write the authority screws over someone and they all fight the authority. It's lazy booking. It's tired. It's lazy. It's lazy is what it is. The authority is laziness at its peak. If you had a Mount Rushmore of lazy, 
the authority and any kind of pro wrestling authority figure that acts in a rule breaking capacity is lazy booking. Why is it lazy? I'm glad you asked. Wait, what's that? You didn't ask? Well, too bad. You're getting it anyway. <laughs> um, why is it lazy? Because it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's like a heat-seeking missile. You know, all the heat goes on to that, that rule-breaking authority figure, and none of it goes to anyone else. So... When you stack the odds against the the uh, fan favorite, you are sitting there and saying, "Oh, you know, you should cheer for the fan favorite because I set him up against these impossible odds." But you should also be booing this uh, rule breaker because I helped him out. But what it really does—that that's the goal. But what it actually does is it says, hey, this rule breaker can't get over on his own, so we're going to try and help him, and we're going to try and shift the blame to us, you know, as a proxy. So because we put this guy in this situation, you should hate him just as much as you hate us. And for the fan favorite that we're screwing... You should be cheering for him because we put him in this, you know, completely unwinnable situation. He's going to, you know, whether he perseveres or not, we don't know. But that's the reason why you should cheer for him. But it's, it's, it's a heat-seeking missile because it takes the heat off of every single person that it should be on and gives it to that rule-breaking authority figure. It's cheap and lazy. So, um, now that we're done talking about how WB books for the laziest possible contingent that they can, let's move on to a little bit more of wrestling, then we'll talk about some mixed martial arts, and we'll sign off uh, on this one. Uh, total nonstop action wrestling, TNA wrestling. It would seem, judging from their new logo... Um, that they are finally trying to rename themselves Impact Wrestling. Now, they have tried to at least unofficially call themselves Impact Wrestling for a while. They kind of shift between TNA and Impact Wrestling. They kind of call by both. It would really, really, really be a good thing for them if they actually did call themselves Impact Wrestling. TNA is absolutely the worst name for a wrestling promotion and not even having anything to do with the fact that it sounds like tits and ass. We're going to put that aside. It's a terrible name. No one knows a name that says wrestling, so you can't tell what the program is, and total nonstop action. Having a bunch of adjectives stuck together really doesn't mean anything. It doesn't say, here's what we're about. We're, we're total nonstop action. That's great. Are you a wrestling show? Are you a stunt show? What are you? There's nothing to say what it is. Now, for all those that will WWE doesn't say anything either, or the World Wrestling Entertainment or WWE, but they've had the advantage of, what, some 50 years to establish their identity? People understand what WWE is. They understand what WWF is. So they they understand what it is. They've had the benefit of of knowing, you know, what WWE is all about. TNA is still after how many years since the collapse of World Championship Wrestling? They're still trying to find their identity. Ten years later. What is it, ten years? Ten, fifteen? What is it, you know? They've gone from Spike TV to Destination America, a channel which is seen in, what, half of the households uh, that, that Spike TV is? I don't know these numbers, so, you know, maybe maybe someone who's got a, 
their finger on, on, on that thing and say, oh, yes, we're seeing it exactly, you know, 2.8 thousand more households or 2.8 million more households. I don't care. It's just not that important to what I'm doing. But speaking of TNA, if you want to see some stuff, we got some good TNA stuff. We got Bound for Glory 4, which took place right here in Hoffman Estates, not terribly far from where I am in Chicago right here. That's on DVD. We've got a couple other TNA things. We've got, uh, you know, the history of TNA. We've got a couple other TNA stuff, a lot of, a lot of cool stuff. And, uh, you know, speaking of cool TNA stuff, they could probably do well with advertising their video and DVD releases, too. Because they've got a lot of them out there, but no one really knows they're out there. And if they want to make money, they really need to do that. You know, they're not any different from any other independent promotion. You got the goods. Try to make money off of them. In any case, they really need to find their way because they still seem to be lost. They still seem to be lost. Hopefully they stay as Impact Wrestling make the change official because TNA, again, is a stupid flaming name. But they really should. Anyway, moving on. So, Jeff Jarrett's Global Force Wrestling. We still don't really have any clue what Global Force Wrestling is. Is it a group that's going to bring Japanese wrestling to American audiences? Are we going to just you know, broadcast their audiences there? Is it a promotion all their own? What exactly is Global Force Wrestling? There's not really a firm explanation of what it is. If all they're going to do is rebroadcast Japanese pay-per-views, hey, terrific. You know, there's probably a better name for them, but, you know, whatever. But they need to better explain what it is. Um... The UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Championship. So the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, two pay-per-views ago. We're going to talk about UFC 182 Jones versus Cormier. First off, outstanding main card. The main event, Jones-Cormier, was outstanding. An outstanding fight, all five rounds. Just terrific fight all around. Oh, the other fights were really good, too. The only thing that I got to say as far as the show in and of itself is that it's six hours worth of fights. If you add in the free stuff, the, you know, prelim card and fight pass, Fox Sports, and the main card, you got all that together. Every single thing together, we're talking almost six hours worth of stuff. That is a lot of time to expect anyone to sit through. That is just an incredible amount of time. That's a lot of time, six hours. So, I don't know of any way they can make it less time. Maybe if they went and reduced the prelim card a bit. But it's a really, really, really long time to sit through. Six hours worth. Because I know when I went to the card, I left here at about six. And they were already showing the fights. And when I left and walked out, I took a peek at my watch and realized it was almost midnight. I'm thinking, damn, I was at that bar for six hours. That's a long-ass time, because I left after the fight. After the main event fight, I left. So that's a long time to sit in one's ass and watch these fights. Um, I did not see UFC 183, but the one thing that I will say about both of those cards, 182 and 183, and this is kind of a, a comment that goes back a, a ways with the UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Championship. They do not do a lot to build up their undercard. They talk a good deal about their main event, but they don't really talk about the undercard, the prelim card, whatever you want to call it. 
there's not a lot of it. There are those guys there, and they got some good names on those the, the undercard, but they really don't build up to it uh, very well. And they could probably do a better job at it than than that than what they are currently doing. Um, the other thing, the thing that bothered me about UFC 183 is that you had the women's match, Misha Tate and Sarah McMahon, on the free prelim card on Fox Sports. So you're having the only female match, the only female weight class, the only the female match that's going to determine who's going to be the number one contender for uh, Ronda Rousey's title, and we're saying it's not good enough to put on the pay-per-view itself. It's only good enough to go and put on the free card. So here's something that could determine the future of the women's division the only weight class that the women have right now, and we're going to put that on the undercard. This is something that deserved to be on the main card. There are probably some matches that could have been bumped to the free card in order to put the Tate McMahon bout on the main card. It's complete crap to go and put the women's bout on the free card when you only have one female weight class. That is just, it's crap. Bottom line, it's crap because I guarantee you next week when Ronda Rousey has her fight, that's going to be a part of the main card. As a matter of fact, UFC 184 is, is built on that bout. It's called Rousey versus Ngano. So we're basing the entire show on two women's matches. The Ultimate Fighter match and the Ronda Rousey. So those are the two main events above everything else. But yet last month we put the number one contendership bout on the free card. So you got to tell me what makes sense. Are we saying that only Ronda draws money? If that's the case, then they got to do a much better job of developing their undercard, which is what I said earlier. The women's division needs to be uh, built up better. They do a really crappy job of building up their undercard. You want me to only believe you have one draw in that division, and that's not fair to Kat Zingano, Misha Tate, uh, Sarah McMahon, Alexis Davis, you know, anyone else. That's really, really, really unfair uh, for all of them to, to be sitting there and being saying that you only have one draw is Ronda. She's on, especially when you have another women's fight between newcomers uh, that's the co-headliner on that fight card. So so that's kind of bullshit. I call bull on that. Uh, uh, shenanigans, if you will. So, you know, if they want their women's division to be serious, if they want to have someone more than Ronda... I understand that Ronda's our main drawing card. John Cena's a main drawing card in WWE. I, I, I understand that. But you can't sit there and say, well, only Ronda is going to be on the main card. Any show that doesn't involve Ronda is automatically going to be on the undercard. Even if it's number one contendership, is crappy. It, it, it's pure garbage, okay? Uh, it's just crap. Bottom line. Uh, I don't think anything else needs to be said about this. I know there are people that say that agree that, that women, you know, don't need to be in mixed martial arts and this and that. But 
you know, if if UFC really wants to get behind the women's division and bring in other weight classes for women, they need to quit the practice of being inconsistent with the women. I know there haven't been a lot of women's matches so far, but they should quit being inconsistent with what they have. That said, uh, we've been going here for about an hour. I don't want this to be um, the hour and a half that the predecessor was, because uh, that's just a little on the longish side. But final thought of the day, before we move into some merchandise here, we are going to talk about a little fantasy booking. This came up a while back, and I wanted to save it for this podcast, so I'm going to put this out there because it was brought up to me, and it was a hell of an interesting question. I didn't want to throw it out there on, on Twitter or Facebook or any other place. I wanted this to be the, the really the, the, the penultimate question that we have here on this podcast before we move into some merchandise to sell. I want to talk about fantasy booking. Not in the way that most people think. But everyone is, hopefully, everyone is familiar with Wrestlicious where this guy won the lottery and put all his money into trying to recreate Glow and have all sorts of campy women's characters. And he was going to put himself as uh, the main guy. He's going to be the David McLean, J.P. Vargas. You know, he's he's wanted to recreate glow. So I want to put out the same kind of a question to my podcast audience. Let's say that you win the Powerball lottery, which at last count was somewhere in the vicinity of three hundred million. So you win that. Doesn't matter what you get after taxes. Really irrelevant. Now You've got this money. You've got this $300 million. The big question, what do you do with it? If you're going to start a wrestling promotion with this $300 million or 150 after taxes, whatever the hell it is, you've got $300 million. You're going to start a wrestling promotion. What's your booking strategy? Going with the proven guys? building a whole brand new pool of talent from scratch, taking guys who are semi-established? Do you go up head-to-head against uh, Vince McMahon and WWE? Do you decide uh, to go against TNA? Do you decide to stick with the independents and and save your money and, uh, and build up? What's your options? So think about what your options are, and then email me at podcast at sfpinkchicago.com. That's sfpinkchicago.com. Yeah, you went and you won your Powerball, 300 million, whatever it is. Tell me, what are you going to do with that cash? What type of wrestling show? Are you going to do Memphis? You're going to have brawls? You know, uh, resurrect ECW as a brand? What's your decision? Whatever your decision is. We'll talk about it. If we get some responses, a podcast at sfpinkchicago.com, we'll go and talk about it. In our next show, we'll talk about some of the response we received because this is a real great chance to get really creative with something, and it's going to be really interesting to see what some of your responses are uh, with regard to that. So, final bit here. We're going to talk about some merchandise that we have to sell. Now, if you've hung around for a while, you know that we have several different distinct divisions. We have our wrestling and MMA. We have our music and movies. We have our Playboy. We've got all sorts of cool stuff. You know, I talked earlier about if you don't have a VCR, you're missing out because there's a lot of great stuff that's never hit DVD. It's not likely to hit DVD. So let's start off with talking about the Brian Pillman Memorial Show. Uh... Heartland Wrestling Association out of Cincinnati, HWA, did the Brian Pillman Show from uh, 1998 to 2001. They put out a terrific set of VHS. Again, VHS. If you don't have a VCR, find one of your local Salvation Army. It would behoove you to do such. Uh, They put 
put out two videos of the highlights from the 98 to 2000 shows. They put out two VHS of the 2001 show. They put out an indie highlight reel. It's a total of five tapes. It's $60, all shipping is included. It's an incredible, incredible showcase. And not only that, but it's one of the few times when WWF, WWE, and WCW somewhat cooperated. I say somewhat because, of course, they refused to go up against each other, but at least they were on the same show. They're on the same card. Uh, one of the fighters is Chris Benoit. If you're looking for Hard Knocks, the Chris Benoit story, we've got that. We've got that VHS. We've got that DVD. we got it both. Um, we've got Tuesday Night in Texas. The Undertaker gets his uh, title back from Hulk Hogan, or, uh, yeah, Hulk Hogan after the, uh, or excuse me, the other way around. I'm sorry. Hulk Hogan gets the title back from The Undertaker after Undertaker wins it in controversial fashion at the Survivor Series. We've got all sorts of cool stuff. We've got, you know, in, in mainstream movies, we've got some 8-tracks. We've got some great music sets. We've got some great music 8-tracks. Uh, we got some CDs. We got a whole bundle of new CDs in. We got the Scorpion King. We got the uh, French version of that. The movie is not subtitled. It's not dubbed, but it's got a terrific DVD CD combination pack. It's very very cool. Um, we you know I talked about earlier, uh, not in this podcast, but it was mentioned on Facebook. We have got some really early UFC from like the mid-30s, late-30s, all the way to, like, 70-something or 80-something inclusive. A lot of cool stuff there. Uh, the AWA, we've got Super Clash. Uh, Super Clash, we've got greatest AWA championship matches. Rick Martel, you know, Rick Martel, if you only know of Rick Martel, is the model and arrogance. Well, you're going to see a different Rick Martel if you go and pick up AWA Greatest Championship Matches with Rick Martell there. It's a different Rick Martell. Uh, Larry Zabisco, the living legend, had a tape put out through the AWA as well. Some good stuff there. Super Clash, Comiskey Park here in Chicago. Uh, Sergeant Slaughter had some good stuff. It's a different persona than seeing Sarge as kind of the stooge that he's portrayed nowadays in, on WWF television. So there's a lot of cool stuff there. Um, Ring of Honor, you want to see independent wrestling. We've got Ring of Honor. We've got literally two boxes worth of really old school Ring of Honor. We're talking the earliest days of Ring of Honor. So, you know, if you got a request for Ring of Honor, why don't you drop us a line and say, hey, I heard your podcast. I heard you talking that you got some Ring of Honor DVDs. What do you got? Here's what I'm looking for. We got some video games. We got some PlayStation. We got PS2, PS3. We got some old Nintendo if you want to get into some early classic stuff. Uh, we got a lot of cool stuff there. Um, we do have a merchandise catalog. We probably haven't updated in a while because it was very cost prohibitive to continue to generate a merchandise catalog when realistically... We can find generally anything out of the sun, and probably a little more, but uh, we do have some archives out there. we got some archives in our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash sfpinc Chicago, so check it out. Check out our website, sfpincchicago.com. Um, we've got a couple other websites out there. Um, they're kind of going to get a facelift. But we're going to kind of wait and focus on the SFP site. And once we get our main site up, then we'll start focusing on the Playboy. But then we'll focus on music and movies. We'll focus on our comics site. Um, we've got some great old comics, too. Some stuff from uh, the big comics boom of the mid-90s. A lot of independent publishers. we got a lot of mainstream stuff. Uh, we got some graphic novels. We got the Power of Shazam and graphic novel. We got some other stuff. 
some great stuff we just uncovered. We got the Sandman, Neil Gaiman Sandman. We just got done bringing that into inventory. Uh, my associate just got done inventorying that a handful of days ago. So uh, we got that. A lot of cool stuff out there. So why don't you go and drop us a line, podcast at sfpincchicago.com, and say, hey, I heard your podcast. I'm looking for this. We've got kids' videos. We've got feature films. We've got all sorts of cool stuff. We've got some vintage WWF pay-per-view. We've got vintage movies, feature film movies. We've got comics and graphic novels. We got Playboys. We've got stuff that you probably didn't even know existed. But we know it existed, and we have it. So drop us a line. We've got independent promotions, too. Not just Ring of Honor. We got other places, too. There's a lot more to life than just Ring of Honor and World Championship Wrestling. So drop us a line. Again, podcast at SFP, INC, Chicago, dot com and say, hey, I heard your podcast. What stuff do you got? We got all sorts of cool stuff, and it's just waiting for you to go and ask about it. We got old Memphis. We got, you know, mixed martial arts independence. We got tap out and IFL. We got mainstream. We got kids stuff. The Princess Bride and Go Montoya, probably one of the most famous movie quotes. So drop us a line. Ask us about something. And we'll tell you, we got anime, we got uh, all sorts of cool stuff here. So all you need to do is just ask us. In the meantime, my name is Greg Dennis. I am the president of Shadowfire Promotions. And I will talk to you guys on our next podcast.